compensation. And I really hope we get to Bose Einstein compensation, but since I've been asked to go over again some of the laser cooling ideas uh, that Ken Kuhn talked about uh, last week, I'm going to do that. Um, so I know again, I'm going to be here only till Wednesday, so basically you have to stay tomorrow if you want to talk to me, and I encourage you to do that. Uh, so, you know, see me in the breaks, during the meals. Um, uh, you know, come by my uh, apartment in the evening and knock on the door. Uh, anytime before 10 o'clock, we'll talk. Uh, you might even get microwave popcorn, who knows. Um, there's no sign on the door, but it's right uh, uh, in view of where uh, Pierre lives in 2404. That's right. So if you find that, it's near where the petrified log is. Uh, you should be able to find it. Okay. I think you have a map of the casinos in your program. So, uh, just to remind you what we did before, we talked about the Ramsey method of separated oscillatory fields in the context of atomic clocks and motivating why one would want to do laser cooling in the first place uh, because of all the emotional effects on the clocks. We talked about uh, radiative forces, both the spontaneous uh, forces and dipole forces. We talked about the dress down picture. Uh, which you heard again from uh, Michel Lukin. We talked about the force on the moving atom and how it's affected by the Doppler shift and how that can lead to uh, laser cooling, damping, and heating, and the balance between damping and heating giving you the, uh, the Doppler. So that's what, uh, where we got to last time. Now, uh, because of the question I got afterwards, I wanted to emphasize uh, an important point about thinking about the scattering force on the moving atom. So uh, just to review, if you've got a plane wave and a moving atom, then you can calculate the force. And the force is um, equal to the momentum transfer per photon times the rate of scattering photons. And this whole expression here is the rate of scattering photons, where you modify the detuning uh, of this Lorentzian um, resonance line uh, due to the fact that there's a Doppler shift, Kb. Now the point that I want to emphasize is that this force is an average force because it's made up of a bunch of impulsive transfers of momentum to the atom that occur at some rate. It only makes sense to talk about this thing as being an average force if you can do the average, which is to say that you average over many of these processes. Well, you can't do that if this Doppler shift per photon is significant compared to things like the detuning and the line width. So it doesn't make sense to write this kind of an expression unless you can average over many photons, and if those many photons, no one or few of them change the detuning of the laser with respect to the resonance because the Doppler shift by very much. So that's what this is. You have to be able to average, and the thing that guarantees that is this that the recoil shift, uh, the Doppler shift, due to a one recoil velocity, has to be very much less than gamma uh, and delta. And that's typically true for most alkali atoms being laser cooled on a resonance transition, a, a dipole out transition. But it's not going to be true for things like alkaline earth atoms being cooled on very narrow intercombination models. So, uh, so you can't use this whole idea, and other kinds of, uh, of ideas can be used to very good effect when you have narrow lines and, uh, and a big recoil shift. So I just wanted to make that point clear. Okay, so we got uh, in the last lecture a cooling force uh, versus velocity for Doppler cooling, and it looks something like this. Uh, um, when I've got equal intensity, uh, equal detuning beams, counter-propagating, uh, then at when the atom has zero velocity, there's an equal absorption from each of the two beams, so the force is zero. And the force uh, is uh, always opposing uh, the velocity when you're detuned below resonance. Uh, and you have this large uh, region of velocity, uh, typically called the, the capture velocity, over which the force is large and linear in velocity. Now, uh, I say that it's a large range of velocity. It's not that large. For something like uh, uh, an alkali atom, uh, this is going to be a few meters per second. 
and uh, typical alkali atoms have velocities of hundreds of meters per second. In fact, with, with sodium, which is pretty light, you heat it up uh, a lot, typical velocities of a thousand meters per second. So what are you going to do? You're, you're not going to use this cooling force to significantly cool down a gas of, uh, of sodium atoms that has a, a, velocity, a typical velocity, spread of velocities that's on the order of hundreds of meters per second. And so one approach uh, to doing that is to uh, slow down an atomic beam. So here's the idea. Uh, you, you make an atomic beam by having an oven where you heat up uh, hot alkali metal. Uh, the vapor comes out through a hole in the side of the oven. You have a, a collimating slit or a collimating hole so that you make a beam of atoms going this way. And now what you want to do to slow this beam down is have a laser beam come in the opposite direction. Uh, now, that sounds great, except for the following. Uh, typical sodium velocity is on the order of 1,000 meters per second, with a spread that's on the order of 1,000 meters per second. And every time a photon is absorbed by a sodium atom, it changes the velocity by 3 centimeters per second, which is a pretty tiny fraction of the uh, velocity. And this is going to be true for all the alkalis. For all the alkalis, this, you know, it's going to be on the order of a centimeter per second. Uh, a few millimeters per second, compared to hundreds of meters per second for the thermal velocities. So, uh, uh, but, but here's, here's the real problem. The Doppler shift of this thousand meters per second uh, uh, velocity is huge. It's on the order of, for sodium, it's on the order of 1.8 gigahertz for the Doppler shift. Uh, and it's got a spread of velocities that's that's as big as the typical velocity. So that means if you send a laser beam of a particular frequency, it's going to be resonant with a tiny fraction of the atoms in the velocity distribution. And for those atoms that it's resonant with, it will uh, cause those atoms to absorb photons. They will change their velocity by this tiny amount per photon and change their velocity and therefore their Doppler shift by an amount such that by the time it's absorbed about 100 of those photons, it's no longer in resonance with the laser. The result is that this process, which looks so simple, will slow down a tiny fraction of the atoms by a tiny fraction of their velocity, which isn't what you're interested in doing. What you want to do is to slow down most of the atoms by essentially all of their velocity. So this isn't going to do it. So how do you do it? Uh, the one good idea I had my entire life uh, was a you make a solenoid with more windings up at the, uh, at the front end and fewer windings per unit length down at the, at the low end. You know that the, the magnetic field, the solenoidal field, is a function of the turns per unit length. So that means you've got a higher field up here than you have down here, and you make something so that the field as a function of distance does something like this. Now the idea is that you tune the laser coming in here so that it is in resonance with some chosen relatively large velocity, let's say a thousand meters per second, when the atoms are here at the place where the magnetic field is highest. Because, of course, the magnetic field induces a Zeeman shift on the energy levels of the atoms and some transition in the atoms. And if you cleverly choose your transition, it will be a favorable one. Some transition will be Doppler shifted by the uh, by the magnetic field, and you just choose the detuning of the laser, given the Doppler shift, and given the Zeeman shift <coughs> due to the magnetic field, the uh, laser is resonant with the atoms that have, say, a thousand meters per second right here. Those atoms absorb light from the laser. They slow down a little bit, but they're still moving close to a thousand meters per second. They move to a place where the magnetic field is slightly weaker. Their Zeeman shift changes. And if you design the magnet correctly, the Zeeman shift changes by the same amount that the Doppler shift changed, and the two compensate each other so that the atoms that are here and a little bit slower are still in resonance with the laser, and they continue to absorb light, and they go all the way down to the end of the magnet, which may be on the order of a meter long, and they've stayed in resonance the whole time. So that's great. You've slowed down those initially 1,000 meters per second atoms, or whatever velocity you chose, uh, all the way to close to zero, which is great, but it's better than that.
the atoms that were 900 meters per second are invisible to the laser until they get to here. Then they start absorbing the light, and they also uh, go all the way down to the end of the magnet and lose almost all of their velocity. So you sweep all of the velocity distribution that is below whatever the chosen highest velocity was, you sweep them all down to a, a low velocity, and as a result, you get most of the atoms cooled down by most of their, uh, of their velocity. And this uh, Zeeman cooling technique is now widely used uh, when you want to get lots and lots of, uh, of atoms uh, laser cooled. Now, it's not the only method that, uh, that can be used. Uh, chirp cooling is just what it sounds like. You chirp the frequency of the laser. So instead of having a changing magnetic field, you have a changing laser frequency. And it works just the same way. You start the, uh, uh, the laser frequency at some, <coughs> at some frequency that will, with the Doppler shift of some given maximum velocity that you choose, be resonant with the laser. And then you just increase the frequency of the laser. That's what a chirp is. You increase the frequency of the laser as time goes on to follow the changing Doppler shift of the atoms. And this was widely used at one time. And there's a number of other techniques that have been proposed, demonstrated, and never widely used for, um, uh, for experiments. So that's one way, and in fact, it's a very common way that people use to, uh, to match between the typical thermal velocities and thermal velocity distributions you have and what optical molasses can do. Uh, there's another way, and I'm not sure if I'm going to talk about it in more detail, but you just um, load your laser cooling uh, uh, optical molasses from the low end of the velocity distribution of a thermal distribution of velocities. Uh, there aren't very many atoms there, but if you wait long enough, you can, uh, you can get lots of atoms. And if you use a magneto optical trap, which has only been discussed briefly, I think, uh, last week, uh, then uh, you can build up the density. And this works very well also, and is, is another one of the widely used techniques. Okay, well, uh, if we have all the lights out, you can see this is an actual picture. Can we turn all the lights out just briefly? <laughs> this is an actual picture taken with film, you know, an amazing uh, a substance that's light sensitive that used to be used in cameras. Uh, except it's still too light here. I mean, well, you, I you can't turn off this. Well, no, we used to be able to turn them off. There we go. Beautiful. Now I think you can see it. So this is an actual photograph in an apparatus that was laser cooling sodium. Uh, so it's real color, or almost real color, as much as film you read it is. This is a pair of counterpropagating beams along this axis. Another pair of counterpropagating beams along this axis. This is actually in three dimensions, so it's sort of compressed along this direction. Uh, and uh, uh, this is the laser beam that's cooling the atoms coming from uh, the atomic beam, and the, the very slow atoms, things that have velocities on the order of 10 meters per second, fall into this uh, intersection region and uh, uh, are, are detained. They're not really trapped by the optical molasses, but in this particular uh, a photograph they're detained there, and this represents something like 100 million atoms over about a, uh, a one uh, cubic centimeter volume. And so in the early days, one of the questions was, how do you measure the temperature of atoms that are that cold? Well, this was the, uh, uh, the method that was um, uh, invented by Steve Chu, now the Secretary of Energy. Yes, question? That was a mock. That was not a mock. That was molasses. So this was actually done before the mock was invented. So that picture was taken uh, a long time ago, before the mock was invented. <laughs> okay, so that was, so even though it doesn't trap the atoms, because the damping is so strong, when the atoms hit that region, they stay for a long time. So it's not a trap, but it builds up density just the same as if it were a trap. It's just a trap with a relatively short lifetime, because the atoms go in uh, and they struggle to get out because of the high damping. Okay. So how do you measure the temperature? So this was the method uh, invented by Steve Chu, who, as I mentioned, is now the Secretary of Energy. Uh, so here's the atoms in the optical molasses. They're jiggling around, but they're not going very far, because as soon as they start moving in one direction, the damping is so strong 
that they're soon moving in another direction. And so they have to random walk out of the molasses. And the step size for that random walk is really small. And as a result, it takes them a really long time to get out, on the order of a second or even sometimes uh, several seconds. So the atoms don't go anywhere, not very fast anyway. Then you turn off the laser beams, and now the atoms are free to move with whatever velocity they had at the time you shut off the, uh, uh, the laser beams. And you just let them expand for a certain length of time, some milliseconds. And then you turn the laser beams back on, and a certain fraction of the atoms are still within the intersection region of the laser beams. You measure the ratio of the atoms that you started with to the ratio to the atoms that you end up with. And by knowing all about the geometries, you can figure out what the, uh, uh, what the, uh, the temperature is, assuming a, uh, a massive voltage distribution of uh, velocities. So they did that in 1985 uh, in, in uh, uh, this uh, uh, group led by Steve Chu. And they measured with a relatively large uncertainty this uh, temperature of 240 microcalvin. Now, if you remember from the previous lecture, if you just plug in the numbers that you expect for the cooling limit, the lowest temperature that you can get by Doppler cooling for sodium, the temperature is 240 microcalvin. So everybody was really happy because uh, it meant that uh, uh, getting the lowest possible temperature. Uh, and we repeated those measurements uh, and by exactly the same method, got the same result. Um, and other people at uh, uh, in Joa did measurements with uh, cesium and got the appropriate cooling limit for cesium. But then we started to fool around, always a good thing to do in the lab, and tried to see if the molasses was behaving in the way it should in other respects. For example, was it as sticky as it was supposed to be? What was the lifetime? How long did it take the atoms to diffuse out of the molasses? You can calculate that and uh, see how it depends on intensity and mutinium. Uh, you can unbalance the beams so that you have a different amount of intensity coming from one side than from the other. That produces a net force that should cause a drift of the atoms so that they should empty out of the molasses, and that should depend upon intensity, but imbalance, and, and things like detuning and, and, uh, and overall intensity. And uh, none of those things behaved the way they were supposed to, and we couldn't understand why. And we spent a long time trying to figure out whether perhaps we had uh, neglected some strong field effects, for example, because if you remember from last time, I said I was neglecting the interference between the two uh, laser beams, uh, and we tried to figure out whether that was the cause of the problem. It wasn't. Um, all of those things went in the opposite direction from the kinds of things that we were observing. So finally we decided uh, that we should remeasure the temperature and measure it as a function of detuning and uh, intensity to see if we could get some clue as to what was going on. Uh, so we, you'll notice that there's a large uh, uncertainty here, and uh, we thought we should do better. So we decided on a different method for measuring the temperature. The, uh, uh, we now call this the time of flight method. Uh, so here's the atoms held in the optical molasses. You turn off the, uh, the, uh, uh, the laser beams. Now the atoms are free to expand. They also drop under the influence of gravity. And uh, as they drop, the cloud expands. And uh, you have a probe laser down here. And if the cloud is very big, then it'll take a long time for the atoms to pass through the probe laser, and you've got a wide pulse of uh, atoms going through. And if the, uh, the cloud is very cold, then it won't get very big, and you'll get a short pulse of atoms going through. And the shape of the um, of a pulse of atoms, which you see by the fluorescence released uh, from the atoms as they uh, pass through the probe laser, the shape of that pulse will tell you what the velocity distribution is, and from that you can the temperature. Uh, now, as an aside, today it's very common for people to use what is called a time of flight technique, but it's slightly different. You just have the atoms, and then you release them, and uh, they uh, expand. You just measure the size of the cloud. You just take a picture of the atoms. Yes, they do drop, but uh, if you are looking at them from the top, then you can pretty much ignore that as long as they don't fall out of your, uh, uh, 
depth of focus of your uh, imaging apparatus. So you just take an image of how big the cloud has gotten, and that's the way people do time of flight today. But anyway, this is the way we were doing it back in the, uh, the late 1980s, and this was the result we got uh, when we did that. We found that the uh, distribution of arrival times of the atoms was consistent with a temperature of 40 microkelvin, when the lowest temperature allowed by the theory of Doppler cooling was 240 microkelvin. And uh, we were confused by that. Uh, I mean, you all know how this story ends, right? Uh, one of the things that is an interesting story, perhaps a, a cautionary tale, when we first uh, set up this experiment to measure the uh, um, uh, time of flight distribution to determine the temperature, we did not do it the way I've illustrated it here. We put the probe up here on the top because we knew that the temperature had to be at least as high as 240 microkelvin. And at 240 microkelvin, the way in which the atoms drop <coughs> is essentially irrelevant because they expand so rapidly uh, due to the, uh, their thermal velocities that whether you're above or below just doesn't make any difference. So we put the, uh, the probe up there and we saw nothing. And uh, we just, you know, we're checking everything to make sure that we weren't doing something stupid. And we weren't doing anything stupid except having put the probe above. And finally we decided, let's put the probe below and boom, we saw a bat. And were we ever surprised? Uh, so, um, so how, how did you resolve the fact that you're releasing the capture said 240? Yeah. So, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's something that's, uh, uh, you know, a little bit embarrassing, uh, especially for the people who published it. We never published it, so it wasn't quite as embarrassing for us. Uh, and we didn't apply any uh, uncertainty to it. You notice that the uncertainties are asymmetric. They don't go much below the lowest temperature that you're allowed to have. They go a good bit above the lowest temperature you're allowed to have. Okay, so what was the answer? Um, when later, after we did this, we were not convinced because we thought, well, you can't have a temperature that low, so there must be something wrong. So we developed three other methods for measuring the temperature before we published the uh, results. You know, it's one thing to have, have results that are different from what everybody expects, but you better have the evidence. <laughs> and so we, uh, and one of those other methods was a refined version of release and recapture. What we did was we were very careful about knowing what the geometry of the beams were. And we took into account in the analysis the fact that the atoms were dropping. You see, if you don't take into account the fact that the atoms will drop, it'll look like they're hotter because they'll fall out of the region where you're expecting them to be, and you will interpret that as having expanded by thermal velocities out of that region. So when we were extremely careful about the, um, uh, all the geometry things, then we found agreement between the, uh, 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 the results. Another point was this. Uh, when, good heavens, why was it doing that? So you got the whole lecture while I was uh, <laughs> uh, talking. Yes, Mark. Actually, uh, there could be lots of other reasons why they had 240 micro. Sure. I mean, maybe they didn't. Well, okay, so, so I'll tell you exactly why they believe they had 240 micro. Uh, they were using an ion pump. Ion pumps have residual magnetic fields. You can calculate the effect that those residual magnetic fields will have on Doppler cooling and find that they're completely negligible. But the kind of cooling that actually happens is very sensitive to the presence of a magnetic field, as we learned once we started to fool around with it. And if you ask yourself what temperature you expect when you have a, a fringing field of a gauss, then it's on the order of 240 microcolon. In our experiments, we had been very careful to zero out those fields, not because we thought it was necessary, but we, we just thought it was probably a good idea not to have a lot of fringing fields in our uh, and our apparatus, so we were sort of lucky in that regard. Now, in our own experiments, why did we get 240 microcalm? Because we knew that the coldest temperature would be when you tune the laser a half line width from resonance. So we were just doing it quickly, and we said, let's tune the laser very carefully to the place we know where we get the lowest uh, uh, temperature, according to the theory. 
We set it there and we measured it. Later we found out that the temperature gets much colder as you move further and further from residence. But if you stick at about a half line width from residence, you get about what the old theory said the cooling limit should be. So there were plenty of reasons why those first measurements produced things that were in agreement with the theory. But you know how it is. You get something that's in agreement with the theory, and you say, oh, great, now it's time to stop. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Lou. Uh, Bill, uh, these geometric factors, then, if I look at those distributions, the 240 uh, microkelvin actually has a width that's comparable. Yeah, and that's that. because they're going so fast that they get out of there. Uh, uh, so, so it's a combination of the fact that the temperature is higher, so they're just going, they're all just going faster. So they hit faster, and that's why you have a, a, an earlier leading edge. And then they're out of there faster too, so, so that's why it, it drops. But you'll notice at long times, there will be, uh, basically it's the atoms that went up and came back down, at long times you have more from the hot, uh, from the hot atoms. It's kind of a complicated thing when you're asking you know, what happens, but, but we modeled it all very carefully in the end. Okay. Oh, yeah, so, so, so the dots are the actual data. So this um, uh, drop here has to do with the fact that um, uh, there was a lot of light coming from the molasses itself, and you turn it off and there's a kind of a transient in the detectors and all that, so uh, so that just comes from uh, from from transients. Uh, uh, it, it's a, basically of no significance. It's just uh, just an instrumental effect. Yes, Mark. But does, does it tell us the decay time of your detector? Like it's, it's only a uh, few milliseconds. Yeah, it's just out every sharp feature by by that amount. Yeah. So so I forget the details. Remember, this was a long time ago. <laughs> so I forget the details about what was going on here. Uh, uh, this is before we shut laser beams off with acoustic optic modulators. We used choppers. There was all kinds of things that were really slow back then. So I don't know. I don't remember the details of why all this was uh, was was on the order of milliseconds. But you know, we would never do it like that today. But this was in the dark ages. Believe me. <laughs> okay. So um, soon. Uh, Jean Dalibar and Claude Comatinucci at uh, Ecole Normale and Steve Chu and his colleagues at Stanford figured out what was going on. And what was going on involved four things that were not taken into account in the theory of laser cooling uh, that, that we've uh, uh, described before. And uh, uh, it's really hard for you people in the back, isn't it, to see the bottom of the screen. And there is a way that I can change that. Uh, so let me just see. If I can take 30 seconds and figure out how to, uh, to do that. Actually, this was done on the TV. That have um, let's see. Now, if we do that, then I do that. No, that's not it. Okay. And then here I do. No, I do it. Okay. Um, yeah, but, okay. Now, okay, good. So is that good? I mean, it's, it's all distorted, but at least you can see it. I'm very happy to get up every once in a while to keep the blood flow. Yeah, there's that too. <laughs> so, so are the people in the back happier now? Okay. <laughs> Good, but now you just have to remember that everything is stretched out. <laughs> okay, so multi-level atoms. The assumption in the old theory was that these were two-level atoms. You excite from the ground state, it goes to the excited state, and the only place it can decay is back to the same ground state that it came from. Now, everybody knew that that wasn't true, but everybody figured that uh, it was a perfectly good approximation and everyone was wrong. Uh, you know, Einstein once said, you should make things as simple as possible, but no simpler. Well, this is an example of having made things simpler than was possible, or at least than was advisable. Uh, okay, so this is a, the simplest example of a multi-level atom that shows the effect of interest. So the ground state is a, uh, and momentum equals a half, so it's got two sublevels, which normally are degenerate, uh, minus a half and plus a half, that's the projection of the angular momentum along the axis of quantization. And the excited state is a three half, so it's got four states. In such a situation, you have lots of different transitions that are possible depending upon the polarization of the light. So you can go from plus a half to plus three halves with sigma plus light, and the Clutch-Gordon coefficient for that 
uh, has a square that I'm going to uh, uh, normalize to 1. The Klebsch Gordon coefficient, the square of the Klebsch Gordon coefficient for 1 half to 1 half with a white that is linearly polarized along the direction of quantization is 2 thirds. And uh, when you use sigma minus light and go from plus a half to minus a half, then it's one third. So you have these different strengths of, uh, of transition depending upon which transitions you choose, and different transitions are driven by different polarizations, none of which is, is anything that shows up when you have a, a, a two level atom. Okay, so that's the multi level atoms. Polarization gradients. Imagine that I have uh, two counter propagating laser beams and they are linearly polarized but they are lin linearly polarized in orthogonal directions. Now, you people say, well, why did you ever put in orthogonally polarized laser beams? We didn't, of course. Although now we do, because we realize that it works better, and we confirmed that it works better. But when you've got a three-dimensional configuration of laser beams, they can't all have parallel polarizations, right? Because light is transverse. So that meant that somewhere in there was something that looked like this. So now what would happen if this were the case? So now the idea is that I've got uh, this laser beam here is polarized horizontally. So that means that it's propagating like this and it's oscillating like this. Can you see me? Is there enough light in the room to see or do we need to turn on more, more lights? This laser beam is propagating this way and its polarization is going like this. Now what you want to do is think about what happens when you're an atom and you're some particular point in space, say here, at some particular point in space, you're going to find that the phase of the vertically polarized beam and the phase of the horizontally polarized beam are in phase. So it looks like this. And that is linearly polarized light along 45 degrees. So that's what you've got here, linear polarization. But move yourself just one-eighth of a wavelength in this direction. You are now 45 degrees uh, behind in phase from the light coming from this direction and 45 degrees ahead in phase from the light coming from this direction compared to when you were here when you were in phase. So that means this one and this one are 90 degrees out of phase. And that is circular polarization because Circular polarization is just the superposition of two linear polarizations that are 90 degrees out of phase. So just by moving an eighth of wavelength, the polarization changes from being linear to being circular. Another eighth of a wavelength, and you're now uh, uh, 90 degrees out of phase, uh, or phase lag from there, 90 degrees ahead of phase there, and you're 180 degrees out of phase compared to what you were here. So here you are like this, and here you're like this. And that also produces linear polarization, but uh, in the orthogonal direction. If this thing weren't distorted, these two things would be at right angles. And then you go another eighth of a wavelength, and it's circular in the opposite direction. And half wavelength, you're back to being linear in the same direction you were before. So in the process of going just a half of a wavelength, the polarization has changed from linear to circular to linear to circular to linear again. That's the polarization rate. Okay, so that's the second feature that we need to know about. Light shifts. So we've already heard about this in the context of the dressed atom as well as in the context of uh, perturbation theory. When you shine light on, uh, on something and it's off resonance, you will shift the energy as a result of what some have called the AC start effect. And if the detuning is below resonance, which is what everyone always did, because that was what Dr. Kuhn said you should do. If the detuning is below resonance, it will shift the ground state down. And it will shift the ground state down by an amount that's proportional to the intensity of the light, the strength of the transition, because remember the light shift is the Robbie frequency squared divided by four times the detuning. We got that in a number of different ways. And the Robbie frequency has to do with the uh, uh, electric field strength and the transition dipole moment, which depends upon the strength of the transition. So that means that the strongest transition will shift the uh, level down a lot, and the weakest transition will shift it down less. 
So let's think about this level here, the m equals minus a half, being driven by a sigma minus light. That's the strongest transition. So when a, the atom is at a place where the polarization is sigma minus, then this state will be shifted down by a lot. And this state, being driven on this transition, which is a third less strong, will be shifted down by a third as much. That's what happens here. Now, if we move over to where things are linear, then we've got uh, these transitions. They're the same for each of the two states, and they're two-thirds. It's not shown on this diagram, but they're degenerate. So at this point in space, the two states are degenerate. At this point in space, the two states reverse their roles. This state, the plus, the plus one-half state being driven by sigma plus, is driven very strongly with a strength of one, so it's pushed way down. This state, the minus one half, being driven by this transition, which is weak, we push down only to here. And so what happens is that this state, as a function of position, goes up and down and up and down, and this state goes down and up and down and up. They do the opposite things in this simple example. Okay, so that's three out of four things we need. The last one is optical pumping, which we've also talked about before. Let me go over it again. The idea is that if I've got this uh, configuration of states, and if the atom is in the m equals minus a half state and being driven by sigma plus light, in other words, the atom happens to be at the place in space where the light is sigma plus, then the only thing it can do is go up to the m equals plus a half state because uh, uh, it has to absorb the angular momentum of the light. But when it decays, it can either decay back to where it came from or it can decay to the plus one-half state. If it decays to the plus one-half state, the only thing it can do is go to the plus three-half state. And the only thing the plus three-half state can do is decay to the plus one-half state, because it can only change the projection of angular momentum by one. So it's got no place to go. So if the atom is in the minus one-half state, it will soon end up in the plus one-half state. And if it's in the plus one-half state, it will stay there. It spends most of its time in the ground state anyway because it's not being excited very strongly. So that means that if you are at a place in space where the uh, polarization is sigma plus, you will optically pump to the lowest energy state. And if you're at a place where it's sigma minus, you will optically pump to lowest energy state when the detuning is less than zero, which of course it always was because that was the right thing to do for Dr. Cole. So. Here's the deal. You're here, you optically pump to the lowest energy state. You, you're moving. So you climb up this potential energy hill. This, the, the, the dipole force produces a potential that is a potential energy for the atoms. That's why we can use them as traps. You climb up out of this trap. It's sort of, it's, it's like a trap. We would now call this an optical lattice. If you climb up, and when you get to the top, you notice that the polarization has changed from being uh, sigma plus to sigma minus, and you absorb the sigma minus photons, and you optically pump down to the other uh, state, the one that's lowest in energy, and you climb up again. And when you get to the top, you absorb the other polarization of light, and you optically pump down to the bottom. And this is an oversimplified view, but it, it illustrates the basic idea that the way in which the atom loses uh, energy as a result of this cooling process is because it climbs up against the light shift potential and then it is optically pumped to the lowest energy state. And uh, Dalibar and Kontenuji called this Sisyphus cooling after the uh, ancient myth of Sisyphus, who was the king of Corinth, who was sentenced to an eternity in Hades, rolling a stone up the hill. Um, now, to take a slightly more sophisticated way of what's happening, of understanding what's happening is, the atom optically pumps here at the bottom to having all the population at the bottom. And as you move it, this would be in the case where the atom moves extremely slowly, the populations become equal in the two states due to optical pumping. As you climb further, you get more and more of the population down here and less of the population here. And that's what would happen if the atoms are moving infinitely slowly and being given a chance to equilibrate as they were going on. But the atoms are moving, and as a result of moving, uh, they, uh, they lag behind. There's not enough time for them to reach equilibrium. 
So if an atom is moving this way, then at this point where the population should be nearly equal, it's got a higher population in the lower state. Whereas an atom that's falling, that's coming down, has less population than uh, in this uh, state that's going down because it, it's trying to grow the population, but it hasn't had enough time to come to equilibrium. So you have an excess of population when you're going up and a deficit of population when you're going down, and it's that difference in, uh, uh, in the fact that you've got m always more going up and less going down that leads to the, uh, to the, the rapid loss of energy. Now, uh, uh, as a result, it cools faster, and you get to lower temperatures. Now, Hanpu went through uh, this in some detail, so I'm not going to because we have so many things to cover, but let me just give you, again, the, the basic idea of what's going on here that leads to the, the temperature for Sisyphus cooling. The energy loss is because of climbing up these hills. So that's, uh, that's a much bigger energy loss than what comes from Dobrik cooling, which is just the, the momentum transfer due to the, uh, the photons. The heating process is also different in the Sisyphus case, because the heating process comes from the fluctuations of this dipole force. When an atom decays from the excited state, it can decay to this uh, uh, state, the lower one, or it could decay to the upper one. On average, it's going to end up in the lower state more often, but it can go to either one. And that means that there will be a force due to this dipole force that fluctuates back and forth depending upon whether the decay is to this state or to that state. And the fluctuation of that dipole force is the thing that uh, is the major contributor to the heating process in this uh, Sisyphus cooling mechanism. And so you calculate what the friction uh, is, you calculate what the, uh, uh, what the heating is, and, uh, and you can end up with the temperature. Now, this uh, uh, is just to compare what the friction is for the Sisyphus case compared to the Doppler case. This is the detuning dependent um, Sisyphus force. It goes like the detuning divided by the line width, uh, multiplied by the velocity. This one goes like the, um, uh, well, it, it, it basically goes like the, uh, uh, the how should I put this, the, the recoil shift. Uh, and this is the maximum value. This is what happens if you optimize the intensity of the tuning. This is what it is when you give, uh, just in general. The thing to notice here is it depends on the intensity. And it goes like the, um, uh, it, it falls off rapidly as the detuning increases, okay? This one does not depend on the intensity. And it increases as the detuning increases. Now, first of all, that sounds odd. How can it be that it doesn't depend on the intensity? Uh, the reason is that uh, as you reduce the intensity, then the height of this uh, hill goes down. But how far up the hill you get increases. So the two cancel each other out, and uh, the force is independent of the intensity. Now you're going to say, but wait a minute. What happens if I turn the intensity off? OK, we're going to come to that in a moment. <laughs> but at least for a reasonable range of intensities, the force is independent of the intensity. At least, well, this force is independent of the intensity. Uh, as long as the velocity is low enough that you don't go up over the top and back down. Okay, So the capture range will go down as you reduce the intensity. But the slope of the force near velocity equals 0 stays the same. But uh, then you have this fluctuation, which is uh, uh, also going down as you uh, reduce the intensity because of the fact that the uh, slope here is going down. So the, the force that fluctuates goes down. Also, the rate at which it fluctuates goes down 
because the rate of spontaneous emission goes down if you reduce the intensity. So, uh, as you reduce the intensity or increase the detuning, the temperature goes down. That was why it was so confusing in the early uh, experiments, because we thought the best thing to do would be to uh, uh, make the, uh, uh, the detuning half aligned with, and that's not true. You want to make the detuning larger. So, so uh, you make the detuning larger and larger and larger, and the temperature goes down and down and down and down, until there comes a point where it doesn't work anymore. And why does it work anymore? It doesn't work anymore because the, uh, the calculation, which uh, I've done here, but I'm not going to repeat because I who already did it, uh, that tells you what the temperature is, gives you the temperature proportional to the, the, the light shift. Okay, so the temperature is always proportional to the light shift. And it turns out it's smaller than the light shift, so in fact the atoms are trapped. Uh, that was what was illustrated here that the atoms are in fact trapped in here because the kinetic energy you, you come to, the, the thermal energy you come to, is smaller than the height of this, uh, of this hill. But what happens when you make this light shift go to zero? The temperature does not go to zero. Why? Because this calculation, which took the momentum diffusion coefficient having to do with the fluctuation of that dipole force, ignores the contribution that we said was all important in the Doppler shift, namely the, uh, the fluctuation in the, uh, the force due to the spontaneous emission, the fact that spontaneous emissions go off in random directions, the fact that, that absorptions are from random directions because of the, uh, the symmetry of the, uh, of the problem, or just, well, there, it, it doesn't even matter whether you've got symmetry or not. There, there's fluctuations in both absorption and emission. And that's ignored in this calculation. At some point, that becomes the dominant uh, source of the fluctuation, and then the temperature goes way up, because that's staying more or less constant, and, uh, and then the, the force is going down, and, and the, uh, the heating's uh, not going down uh, along with it, and uh, we're not going down faster, which is what happens here. And then the temperature skyrockets, and you lose the, the cooling process. But as, as a result, you get really, really cold. You get down to temperatures that are on the order of uh, a few times the recoil uh, velocity. That is, the thermal velocity becomes a few times the recoil velocity. And uh, so that's really, really cold. And I think that, uh, okay, so here's, uh, here's a picture of what the full force looks like. So this envelope is the Doppler force. And then, in addition, there's this polarization gradient uh, subdoctor force with a much, much higher slope, and that's the thing that leads to the, uh, uh, the lower temperatures. And the great thing about it is that when you put uh, reasonably low velocity atoms into this kind of a force curve, this part of the curve brings the velocity of the atoms down toward the center, and then this curve pulls them the rest of the way. So it's a, a kind of a tandem process where Doppler cooling works to uh, get the atoms reasonably cold, and subdoctor cooling gets to, to, uh, to cool them the rest of the way. Now, it is possible to cool things below the recoil limit, and I think that Hans would talk a little bit about that, but we're just not going to have enough time to do that. Velocity coherent population trapping, uh, Raman cooling are among the ways in which people uh, uh, cool things uh, below the uh, recoil limit. So, by doing all of this, uh, we got down to velocities less than a centimeter per second. Uh, for cesium atoms. And so before I go on, um, uh, I'll stop to see if anybody has any more questions about what we've talked about. Just reviewing, we talked about Zeeman, uh cooling of atomic beams, how to measure temperatures, uh, Sisyphus uh, polarization gradient cooling, the limits of Sisyphus cooling I just breezed over, and the capture range. Uh, so are there any questions having to do with any of these topics or any of the, the previous topics? Um, I've always wanted to ask this question. Uh, the, because of the fact that beams are linearly polarized that you're putting together, uh, you, you never uh, are able to make um, a trap that is, uh, is the same along x, y, and z. There'll always be a, a pair where you have this limb foot limb. So, so that means that you've, you've broken a kind of symmetry in your trap. 
Does that have any effect on the atoms themselves? Do they display a broken symmetry in their density and their temperature and anything like that? So, of course, what you're saying is going to be true for traps where those kinds of things are important. For example, in a magneto-optical trap, it certainly is important. And the answer is yes, but it's not particularly well understood. So if you look at a magneto-optical trap and look at the distribution of, for example, of states in a magneto-optical trap, it will not generally be very uniform, and it may, in fact, have a different velocity distribution internal states, although usually that gets pretty well mixed up because the optical pumping is so rapid. But there are asymmetries, and in fact, you can, uh, by adjusting uh, artificially the intensity for different arms of the uh, magneto-optical trap, you can in fact uh, push the, uh, the populations, not so much the temperatures, but the populations, toward uh, other directions. Now there are asymmetries in the temperature too. So if instead of thinking of temperature as a scalar, you think of temperature as a second rank tensor that goes like Vi, Vj, then you can find that there are correlations between the, um, uh, the velocities in, in different directions because of these kinds of asymmetries. But it's certainly possible to make traps that don't have those kinds of, uh, of issues, but those traps will not be traps that are capable of cooling uh, the atoms as well. So your typical dipole traps that may have laser beams coming in from different directions, can be tuned so far from resonance that none of these uh, issues uh, come up. So it's not a problem to make a trap that doesn't have these issues, but the study of uh, the effects in traps that do have these issues has not been extensive, and mainly because it works of what we hear. But, uh, but there was a little bit of work done that, on that in the early days. And heck, how Metcalf was, was one of those who looked at the asymmetry of the velocity distributions in these, uh, in these <coughs> situations. Yes? So it would be wonderful, of course, to, to uh, push uh, the cooling to a limit where we have one atom per uh, well, uh, right? And, uh, and even in the ground state, probably you have to use Raman techniques or, or stuff like that. Um, that, uh, unfortunately, usually doesn't work because when you have more than, you know, yeah. Per side, you know, hell breaks loose and form molecules. What is the prospect of actually <laughs> reaching that? that yeah. So, so as, well, so so as you know, there there's, there there have been some heroic attempts to try to uh, to cool directly into um, uh, these kind of very low entropy situations. Even beyond that, uh, there have been a lot of proposals to try to use sub Doppler and sub recoil techniques to go directly to Bose Einstein condensation. And uh, none of that has, uh, has succeeded. I don't think it's impossible. I just think it's really, really hard. And um, so as far as what the prospects are, people have been trying for a long time. So my guess is that uh, we're probably going to see it eventually. Uh, but you know, since the other methods work, Nobody is really strongly motivated to make the really hard ways work. So I think that's the real answer, is that I don't think there's anything fundamental that says you can't do it. But why bother when you have other ways that, uh, that do it? That's my opinion, not a, a very well-reasoned uh, conclusion, but that's my opinion about, uh, about what's going to happen. I don't want to work on it because i got other things to do, and you do too. <laughs> okay, any more? Questions about up to, yes? Uh, um, how does the picture you presented change when we have a ground state which is not spin one power but spin two, for instance? It becomes more complicated and, wonderfully, it gets better. Now, why that is is a little bit hard to say um, in a hand waving argument, but if you do the, the really full calculation, which involves a, uh, you know, uh, optical block equation with many, many different states and quantizing the motion of the atoms as well, then you find out that, uh, that things work even better with higher angular momentum and you can get to a smaller fraction of light shift with the higher angular momentum uh, states. So that's one of the reasons why, uh, well, in the end though, um, people just work going all the way down to recoil. So it, it, that's the thing that really determines how cold you can get is what recoil limit is.
So it turns out that in a case like cesium, it's the heaviest atom, so it has the lowest recoil uh, energy. So it ends up getting colder than rubidium or, uh, or potassium or, or, or sodium. But in fact, it also has a smaller fraction of the, uh, of the light shift. Uh, and you know, I don't have a good way of telling you why that is. But it's one of those rare cases where more complicated is better. Right? Usually that's not, not the situation. More complicated is usually better. In this case, it is. OK, so, uh, so one of the things that we started off here was uh, we wanted to make clocks. And uh, uh, you, uh, uh, you remember that the old uh, Ramsey beam clock uh, worked this way. You had atoms that were going at 100 or 200 meters per second. Uh, between two regions that are a meter apart. You have the first Ramsey region here, which is essentially synchronizing the uh, uh, precession of the block vector with the microwave field. And then you allow them to evolve freely. And then in the second Ramsey region, effectively you're comparing the phase of the block vector with the phase of the microwave field. And the longer the time you have to do that, the easier it is to, uh, to make that comparison, as well as all other kinds of uh, of uh, motional shifts, the velocity is smaller. And now instead of having velocities that are on the order of hundreds of meters per second, we've got a velocity that's less than a centimeter per second for cesium. And what, uh, what does that do for you? It doesn't do anything for you in this, because the atoms drop like stones. Uh, if you were to try to make an, a, an atomic beam apparatus like this. But back in the 1950s, a guy named Gerald Zacharias at MIT had this idea that you could make an atomic clock by shooting the atoms up through a microwave cavity so that they underwent a uh, pi or two pulse on the way up. And then they would go up and they would fall back down and, uh, and get the second Ramsey uh, interaction on the way back down. And they actually tried to do this experiment at, at MIT. Those of you uh, who were around MIT in the old days may remember building 20. That no, probably nobody here is old enough to have, have remembered Building 20, except maybe Roy, if you ever went over there. <laughs> and they had a stairwell where they did this experiment, and it never worked. And the reason it never worked was because the atoms were never cold. They were thermal atoms. And there were, for reasons that they didn't understand at the time, uh, there just weren't enough low-velocity atoms in the tail of the distribution to make this work. The low-velocity atoms get scattered out of the distribution as they exit the oven. And so there were no low velocity atoms to go up and come back down. Now, this is the way we do it. Uh, and I just want to point out how important it was to get the atoms really, really cold. Because when the temperature was uh, less than a microkelvin, the atoms would go up like this, and their transverse velocities would be slow enough that most of the atoms would make it back down through the cavity. The hole in this cavity cannot be any bigger than about a centimeter. In fact, you get to be about 0.8 millimeters and it starts to go bad. Because it's holding microwaves that have a wavelength of about 3 centimeters. And it's all hell breaks loose if you make these holes too big. If the temperature had been what the Doppler cooling temperature had predicted, it would have looked like this. It would have been really rotten as, uh, as an atomic fountain. So we were awfully lucky. Um, I think I made a comment in, in the session last week about what to do to get grants, that you shouldn't think too carefully about your experiment before you do it. You should pretend that you have in your proposal, but you shouldn't be dissuaded by uh, uh, realizing that things may not work because things might go wrong because of the following reason. It's easy to see all the reasons why an experiment isn't going to work. It's not so easy to see how clever you're going to be to figure out how to make it work. And sometimes, it's a good idea just to go ahead and do it and have a little bit of, uh, of boldness. Now, you know, don't start an experiment that you know is going to violate the second law of thermodynamics or energy conservation or all those things, unless that's what you want to prove. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, if we thought this thing really carefully, we would have thought, there's no way we're going to make a decent atomic clock. But instead we said, it's got to be cool to slow down the atoms. There's got to be something good come out of this. Let's just do it and see what happens. And things worked out pretty well. But if it had been, if we hadn't had self-government cooling, it would have been really rotten. But we didn't think about that. 
So here's a picture of uh, Don Meekoff and Steve Jeffords with their atomic Tom clock. They pull atoms down here, they launch them up here, they uh, fall back down after about a second instead of after some milliseconds, and they get a really, uh, a really good result. These clocks are now uh, better than 3 times 10 to the minus 16. Uh, the accuracy is in part limited by collisional shifts. Rubidium is better in that regard. Black body shifts. The thermal radiation from the environment light shifts the transitions. And it light shifts the um, uh, F equals 3 state of cesium a little bit different from, it, from F equals 4, even though they're very close together. And that is one of the, uh, the limitations in the... Uh, uh, in the accuracy of these uh, atomic clocks. 3 times 10 and minus 16, pretty good. Um, but ions and optical lattice uh, clocks are even better. And Junyi told you about optical lattice clocks, I guess. Uh, and ion clocks are even better. Uh, I don't have time to tell you about ions, uh, trapped ions, but you can trap a single ion in, in, a, uh, in a trap. And these things are now operating at 9 times 10 and minus 18. So, just think about this. You all know, or at least you've heard, that there is a general relativity effect called the gravitational redshift. Clocks close to the surface of the Earth run slower than clocks on mountaintops. When I joined uh, the National Bureau of Standards, now NIST, in 1978, the best clocks were in Boulder, and they had an accuracy of a part of 10 to the gravitational redshift between Boulder and sea level, where there were no clocks of that quality, so you couldn't have tested it if you wanted to, but if you could have had a clock, that shift would have been about one and a half times 10 to the minus 13. In other words, it would have been really hard to see the gravitational redshift with the best clock that existed in 1978. Today, you can see a gravitational redshift that big, that much distance corresponds to it's 9 centimeters. 9 times 10 to the minus 8 is 9 centimeters. And when I started in this business, it was a mile. <laughs> so that gives you some idea of how much improvement has happened in, uh, in atomic clocks, in large part due to, uh, uh, to, uh, to laser cool. OK, so now, um, very, now you've heard this all, right, from Jeanine, right? So let's forget it. Um, <laughs> Okay, so there's probably nothing, well, but if, if you've got any, any, any questions about these clocks, okay, we can, uh, uh, we can cover those things now. Uh, but what I do want, I want to get on to, to Bose-Einstein compensation, since, you know, that's where all the action is these days. Uh, okay, so in 1924, and, and this is absolutely amazing. <laughs> 1924, after Einstein heard about Bose's uh, idea of a new way of counting, he did this calculation, of a, you know, basically a statistical mechanical calculation, that showed that if you had a gas of bosons, and it turns out that most atoms are, uh, are bosons, and if it was cold enough and dense enough, then you would get this wonderful thing uh, called Bose-Einstein condensation, which is a phase transition. Now, first of all, it's really weird that there's a phase transition. This is in an ideal Bose gas, right? Most phase transitions that you know about happen because the, uh, the atoms interact with each other. That's why uh, steam condenses into water, because of the interactions. This is a phase transition that occurs in the absence of interactions, at least in principle. So the calculation that Einstein did was for an ideal Bose gas. And the nature of the phase transition is that a large fraction of the atoms go into the zero momentum state, the lowest possible energy state. They stop moving. Now, today, we would say that they go into the ground state of the system. But remember, this was 1924. This was before Heisenberg. <laughs> okay? This was around the time of, uh, also around the time that, that de Broglie had his is wave hypothesis. So, so Einstein was not working in an environment where he had quantum mechanics and wave, the wave picture of, of atoms. Uh, he was just using the counting statistics. And what he found was that the counting statistics that you had for bosons would not support 
the possibility of adding more particles at a constant temperature. They, they couldn't go into the distribution, and the only place for them to go was into the ground state. And that was how he came up with uh, this, this idea of Bose condensation, that there would come this, this place in temperature and, and, uh, and density, or as we would say today, in phase space density, where any more atoms added at that same temperature would have to go into the ground state. So that was 1924. Uh, uh, people had already seen uh, things like uh, superconductivity and uh, superfluidity, but nobody made the connection. Some people hypothesized sometime later that perhaps uh, superfluidity in, uh, uh, in liquid helium was a result of Bose condensation, but it wasn't that well uh, believed. And in fact, Einstein himself repented of his calculation of, of Bose-Einstein condensation, uh, because he thought, well, this is never going to happen. <laughs> uh, well, I'll keep going that. So, so this is not the way Einstein thought about it, how dense and cold he would have to be, but it's a, perhaps a more modern way that leads to the same thing. It has to do with the um, ratio between the distance between the average distance between particle and their thermoborbrally wavelength, or perhaps more uh, correctly, their coherence length, which is on the order of their thermoborbrally wavelength, because remember, the, uh, in a thermal distribution, the spread of velocities is similar to the, uh, uh, the typical velocity. If you have a hot dilute gas, then the thermoborbrally wavelength is short, and the distance between the atoms is big, and this kind of a gas behaves classically. Whereas when you have a cold, dense gas, the distance between the atoms is small, the thermal degree wavelength is large, and this atom behaves quantum mechanically. This crossover, it's not really a crossover, in this case it's really a phase transition, but it happens in exactly the same place where Einstein calculated in terms of the statistical mechanics of the, uh, of the problem. What I like to say is that since these are indistinguishable particles, when their coherence length becomes comparable to their interparticle spacing, the atoms cannot distinguish themselves from their neighbors, and they undergo a quantum identity crisis. And the response to that is to undergo Bose condensation. Uh, you may not like the anthropomorphizing of the atoms in that way, but uh, I find it a kind of an appealing picture. Uh, but there's a problem. And the problem is that laser cooling does not get you to low enough temperatures. I mean, nobody until 1995 had ever gotten a gas cold enough and dense enough to reach the conditions that Einstein had predicted for uh, Bose compensation. Liquid helium looked like it, uh, it had the right kind of features, but it's a liquid for crying out loud. It's not a gas. And if you try to ask what the momentum distribution of the atoms uh, in uh, liquid helium is, it's not. Uh, the, uh, it, it was very difficult to measure that any of the atoms had, uh, had near zero momentum. And when it was finally measured well, they found that something like 8 or 10% of the atoms had uh, had zero momentum, uh, and that was because of the fact that it was such a strongly interacting fluid. It wasn't a weakly interacting gas the way Einstein had predicted. So nobody had a gas of weakly interacting particles uh, until 1995, and laser cooling didn't get you cold enough. Part of the reason is the following. You can't get to really low temperatures because of this recoil uh, limit. There are ways of going below the recoil limit, as, as we've uh, discussed, although not in a great amount of detail. But it means you can't get very cold. Well, I mean, I mean, this is really cold. So uh, the, the, the recoil limit for rubidium is 400 nanocalvin. You can't get quite that. You get to maybe 6 microcalvin. OK, that's not very cold by today's standards. Uh, it was pretty cold by the standards of anything that came before. And you couldn't get very dense. Uh, you can get to maybe a few times 10 to the 11 in a magneto-optical trap. Why couldn't you get denser? Because the density is limited by collisions that occur in the light field, collisions that are induced by the light itself. And here is a kind of a cartoon, a simplified version of the kind of bad thing that happens when you put cold atoms into a light field. So if you have two atoms that are colliding in the ground state, which is where they spend most of their time, they can absorb a photon and go into this uh, uh, quasi-molecular state that uh, is a ground plus excited. In fact, 
each atom is sharing the excitation, so that each atom is in superposition of ground and excited state. That means they have a oscillating dipole, and they are attracted, if you put them to an attractive state, they are attracted by uh, their, their uh, uh, dipole moments with a 1 over r cubed, a fairly long range attraction. And as a result, they accelerate toward each other, and at some point they decay, just radiatively. And when they decay, they're now on this flat curve, essentially flat, there's only Van der Waals attraction here. And they fly apart with lots of energy. So it heats up the gas, and typically the atoms are lost. They, they leave the trap because they have so much energy. And on the way out, lots of times they hit other atoms, and, and it's just a disaster. So when the, the density gets to be uh, 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 a few times 10 to the 11, you just can't stuff more atoms in there because this process is going up uh, uh, so rapidly. Um, Furthermore, when the density gets to be this high, you can't get to the lowest temperatures that you would get when you had a uh, uh, dilute gas because the atoms reabsorb the light that is emitted, the, the, the light that went in to do the cooling, they reabsorb the emitted light, and it's got the wrong polarization, and it's got the wrong frequency, and it just causes havoc, and, uh, and, and the temperature just doesn't get as low. So it's typical to get densities of a few times 10 to the 11, but with uh, temperatures that are more like some tens of microkelvin instead of some microkelvin. So it just isn't a good situation to get to uh, uh, Bose-Einstein condensation. Typically, the phase space might be five to seven orders of magnitude too small to achieve Bose-Einstein condensation. Does everybody understand the concept of phase space density? Who understands the concept of phase space density? Raise your hand. Okay, not everybody. Okay. So phase space density is the following thing. It's spatial density, number of atoms per cubic meter, times number of atoms per cubic velocity interval. Okay? That's what we mean by phase space density. And the units, actually not velocity interval, momentum interval. Okay? And the units of phase space density in three dimensions are the same as the units of 1 over Planck's constant Q. And the phase space required to achieve Bose-Einstein condensation is when, in those units, it's about 1. So uh, it's a very convenient way of figuring out what you need to do to be quantum degenerate. And uh, you're a long way away from that with, uh, with laser cooling. So how do we do it? What we do is evaporation. So you all know what evaporation is, because when your coffee is too hot, you blow on it. And what is happening when you cool your coffee off is that uh, water molecules are escaping from the surface. And the ones that escape are the ones that have the highest energy. And there's a certain uh, latent heat of vaporization, if you want to think of it that way. But on a microscopic level, it's the most energetic of the water molecules that come off the surface and evaporate. That means that what's left behind has a lower average energy. And you can cool your coffee a lot without losing a tremendous amount of fluid. Well, that same idea you want to apply to, uh, to atoms. You hold the atoms in a trap. Now, it better be a benign trap. It better not be a magneto-optical trap, which is heating and cooling the atoms all the time. You want to turn all that off. So you go to a laser trap, the sort of thing that we discussed uh, last week, or a magnetic trap, which I don't think anybody has discussed. Uh, but it's also benign, and you allow the most energetic of those atoms uh, to escape. You lose some of the density, but the temperature goes down. And because it's a trap, uh, the lower average energy of the atoms, the lower temperature of the atoms, means that the atoms will be compressed into a smaller volume. So it is indeed possible to lose atoms and have the density go up which is a good thing. Now, um, should I talk about magnetic traps? How many people want to hear about magnetic traps? Because it means I won't talk about something else. OK, nobody cares about magnetic traps. Good. <laughs> so uh, you can evaporate from magnetic traps. Now, um, evaporation uh, requires that you have rapid equilibration. So remember when I said 
that you could get Bose condensation with a non-interacting gas. That's true in principle, but in practice, <coughs> you absolutely need those interactions. Why? Because when you do the evaporation, you get rid of the high-velocity tail, but you have to replenish that high-velocity tail to continue the evaporation. If all you did was get rid of the high-velocity tail, uh, you wouldn't really be doing much to the velocity distribution of the atoms. What you want to do is to cool them. That means they have to stay in equilibrium, in thermal equilibrium. The way they stay in thermal equilibrium is by colliding with one another. And the way you continue the evaporation efficiently is to get rid of those small number of atoms that have a large uh, uh, multiple, that, 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 that are much more energetic than the average atom. So you want to get rid of atoms that have five or 10 times the average thermal energy. And in order to have that, you've got to have some re-equilibration that replenishes that, that high tail, that high velocity tail. Uh, and that's going to take several collisions. So you've got to have uh, rapid equilibration because if you don't do it rapidly, something else bad is going to happen. Nobody works in a perfect vacuum. And if it takes you 100 seconds to equilibrate, then a background gas atom is going to come along and hit your cold atom and knock it to kingdom come, and you won't have any sample left. So you better be able to accomplish this on a fairly short time scale, and that time scale is often set by how good your vacuum is. Sometimes it's set by how rapidly you're scattering photons from your optical dipole trap, but there's going to be something that sets a time scale on how rapidly you have to do this evaporation. Usually you'd like to do it as fast as you can. And the thing that limits how fast you can evaporate is how fast the atoms equilibrate. So you do need interactions as a practical matter. This would be so great if you could do it by laser cooling, because the laser cooling would, would uh, equilibrate everything, but nobody's been able to, uh, uh, to do that yet. Okay. So, now, let me just make the following point as well. I've been talking about bosons. Bosons are great, but they're not the only thing there is. There's fermions. If you do this with fermions, you've got a real problem. Because when you cool down your gas fermions, and they're all one component, they're all in the same spin state, the collisions disappear. You don't have any more uh, elastic collisions. Why is that? When you have a, uh, well, one of the ways of analyzing a collision uh, a process is to break it up into partial waves. So how many of you have heard about the partial wave analysis for, for thinking about collisions? Okay, more than half, but not everybody. But, okay, so, so the idea is that um, uh, I can decompose the collision process into its partial wave, starting with uh, zero, moment, uh, zero angle momentum, angle momentum equal one, so that's zero moment is S wave, uh, angle momentum equals one is P wave. You just add them all up, the proper uh, uh, amount, and it reproduces the actual collision that, uh, that you've got. Now, um, when the atoms are going very slowly, in order to have uh, P wave, in order to have one unit of angular momentum, if you think semi-classically, these two atoms are coming along, there's some impact parameter, the distance of closest approach if they don't, um, if their trajectories don't, don't deviate. And when the atoms are going very, very slowly, that distance of closest approach, in order to have one unit of angular momentum, H bar unit of angular momentum, has to be larger and larger the slower the atoms are moving. If that distance is bigger than the range of the interactions, the potentials, then there cannot be any P wave uh, uh, scattering, and all the scattering is S wave. So when you make atoms colder and colder, then the, in a sense the problem simplifies, and the only scattering is S wave scattering, which means that since it's zero angular momentum, it means that it's isotropic, and uh, uh, the uh, <coughs> It's characterized by a single number, which is the scattering phase shift, or ultimately the scattering length. The thing that the scattering length is the thing that, that you can think of as, as the effective size of the atom. It gives it a cross section of equal to four pi 
a squared where a is the scattering length. That's the effective size of the thing. Just one number determines everything. Okay, so that's great, and that's great for bosons. But now think about this if this is if these things are fermions. If this is an S-wave collision, that means that the spatial wave function that describes the two fermions that are colliding 